So, I yeah. Two questions. If the Normans came in and they primarily populated the Republic, as we know it now, yeah. mm -hmm. what was, was the armies or the peoples or the territory prohibited in the North? Question one. Question two. Yeah. Why did they bring French over? Why did they, or did they, did they bring French over? The French language. Why did they bring their language? Why did they? they did. Oh, they did. well, it was the spoken language of the English aristocracy right down until, until the 1400s. That, that, that's kind of what distinguished them, distinguished them yeah. um, which the English don't like to admit to this day. A lot of their kings never spoke a word of English. English was actually not a terribly well-developed language. It was a, a very hybrid pidgin German, you know, a Dutch... Cause, and, and all the various languages of Northern Europe that kind of met and traded in there. Anglo-Saxon, they're very similar, very Germanic. So, but the French was a much more developed language. Um, because remember, the French uh, Gaul had been part of the Roman Empire, whereas most of the Anglos and the Saxons and all those people were not. And they tended to be a, a lot less civilized in the sense of, in the European sense. You know, they didn't have any, they didn't have any um, history or contact with the classical world, being the Mediterranean, Greco-Roman -Civ Greco civilizations. Whereas the French were very, very classical, in the sense that they, they their language and their mores and 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 uh, their learning and so on was very, very steeped in in Roman and Greek. Whereas the others were a wild bunch, huh? That's really interesting. It is, yeah, it so is. They came to huh? Ireland though, and then for, and left their language behind for the most part. <clears throat> Who? The Normans. Um, hmm. Not really. That's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight because um, uh, they actually adapted, which is sort of strange, and maybe we'll try and figure that out. I don't know, but they actually adopted the Irish language, the Gaelic language. Now, there may have been a number of reasons for that. Uh, one can only guess at it, but the Irish language was much more closer to classical European, to, to Roman and uh, Greek uh, scholarship. And all of the traditions were much more connected with, if you know what I mean by classical, as opposed to um, the vernacular languages and the more... Uh, non-Roman civilizations. And I think that may actually have accounted for it because the Irish language was uh, extraordinarily um, um, virile, or, or what's the word? Uh, uh, it, was, it was very, very strong. Um, robust is the word I was looking for. It was a very robust language in, in the function that it fulfilled, which was to, um, to express all the classical thought and so on, and they, they were very good at it. Plus, of course, you also have to remember that throughout that entire period, right down until, in fact, the, certainly the 19th century and even the beginning of the 20th century, anything serious was all written in Latin. You know, if you wanted to write, if you wanted to get any, do anything serious, uh, serious work, it had to be written in Latin. Einstein had to write his thesis in Latin. You know, so uh, <clears throat> yeah. So you know, you weren't a scholar at all. You know, the legal profession, all everything was all written in Latin, right down. It wasn't so just how old is English language? When did it start? I mean, what we speak supposedly today? Oh, well. There's been a lot of, you know, it's a, an iterative thing. Uh, Chaucer and Milton, it didn't really come into its own until the Elizabethan period. You can almost date the English language to the Tudor conquest. And it was a very much like what happened in Ireland too with the, the Celtic revival or the Irish revival. There was an enormous revival of nationalism, English nationalism, and along with it went the, went the English language. Um, so it wasn't really until the uh, Renaissance and surprisingly enough the humanist movement, um, Thomas More, you know, and uh, Erasmus in, in, in uh, Holland and so on. And Ireland actually benefited a great deal from uh, Holland and 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 what you know the Lord the 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 because that was that was a great um, 
place of, of learning and, and, and liberalism, so to speak, uh, at the time. So that the English language um, came into its own uh, in the, the, that in the 1400s. I, that's what I was going to say, talk about the, the Great Plague, you know, because the, 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 that was a huge thing. That had an enormous effect on Europe. And you can almost, it's, it's, it's bigger than any battle that was fought. You can put things before that and after that, just like the American Civil War, antebellum or postbellum. So I would say after that, for the period after that, they started to, um, to come together as a, as a country. But we're kind of drifting a little bit, although they're all part of the same ideas that, that um, drove what happened in Ireland. Because in many ways what, was, what happened in Ireland under the Normans was an extension, a pushing west of what, had, what was happening in, in a bigger way in Europe and in, in England. Because all of Western Europe was going through the same kind of a similar kind of a uh, similar um, uh, <coughs> readjustment. And it, you have to see it all in terms of the the Renaissance, really, you know, the, this um, new ability to think and to not to be um, cowed down by the great authorities, particularly the church, but also the, 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 the church, church and state were identical. The prince, the prince, whatever religion the prince had, that was the religion of his principality. Cuius regnum eius religio. I don't know if you've ever heard that expression, but uh, who, as the um, regio, the, 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 king, the kingdom goes, king goes, so does the religion. But that was the, that was the rule. And it kept peace, actually, in the principalities in Europe for a very, very long time. Cuius regio eius religio, um, which is kind of ironic, isn't it, that uh, total... Um, Identity of church and state was a recipe for peace for about three centuries. Was was that before Luther? Did they yes. use that Latin expression? Yes, yeah. yes, it would have been. Although <clears throat> it was only actually known and thought about and uh, as part of the revolution or the reformation and the counter reformation, because then they started kind of enforcing it. Before it was it was just a fact of life, but um, they resurrected that principle and they settled a lot of arguments uh, by saying, look, if you live over there, the head guy is Protestant, shut up and be Protestant. If you live here, you're Catholic, and that's it, you know, and it worked. And so there's, it, it became, but it, it didn't survive, it, it didn't survive the Middle Ages. I mean, when I say the Middle Ages, Middle Ages is a very vague term. Nobody knows what, what you know, middle, means whatever you, you personally think it is. Um, but anyway, let's see if we can get back to Ireland and see what, what happened here in Ireland and try to understand it in, a context, in, in an Irish context. But it's good that you realize that it's all totally connected with what's going on in Europe. Very, very much connected with what's going on in Europe. Because um, what the Normans brought with them, just like the uh, Spanish brought to California and Mexico, they brought the religion. They came not just with the... Uh, Pueblo and the the uh, garrison, but they brought the the yes, they brought the padres with them as well, the religious way, and all the great religious houses in Ireland all are basically all Norman. Uh, they were all um, brought over after the Norman invasion, um, and they found an expression in in Ireland which is fascinating and it's wonderful to look at. And again, when you see some of the architecture, like the old corbling stones, you don't see that in Europe. So that they adapted even the religious houses, uh, adopted the, um, <clears throat> the, the old Irish architecture, which was great. And you see this lovely blending of, of European Gothic architecture and, and ancient Irish um, uh, stone building. But <clears throat> as always, you have to understand these things in many different aspects. And the economic system is probably the most important because nothing else really happens unless there's an economic system or the destruction of it or, or whichever. For 